So we'll praise God and look into this Ezekiel chapter 47. Let me start with something lighthearted. I heard about this archaeologist in New York. He dug down 10 feet and found traces of copper wire dating back 100 years. He concluded that New Yorkers had a telephone network over 100 years ago. And not to be outdone, an archaeologist in California dug down 20 feet and found copper wiring dating back 200 years. He concluded that Californians had a massive communication network 100 years earlier than New Yorkers. Upon hearing this, Bubba from Texas <laughs> dug down 30 feet on his own farm and found absolutely nothing. And he concluded 300 years ago, Texans had already gone wireless. So, now whether you're from Texas or not, let me ask you to turn your back. wireless devices off and turn your Bibles to Ezekiel 47, 1 through 9. I went to a Southern Baptist uh, seminary and uh, a lot of training and mission work uh, in Texas. Uh, in that part of town. If the Christian life is anything, it's alive, it's progressive, and it's not static. Yes. <laughs> you see, when Lot's wife quit moving, she became a pillar of salt. Christianity is a movement and not a monument. So what does that mean? You know, that's what we're going to be looking at this morning uh, from Ezekiel chapter 47, verse 1 through 9. You see, God is saying to each and every one of us to keep moving. Can you say that with me? Keep moving. Keep moving, keep moving. yes. Moving. You may have to, you know, maybe tell your neighbor or tell yourself because it's a life or death matter. You have to keep moving. Medical science tells us that one of the most important factors pertaining to good health is exercise. That's right. They say that a body in motion stays in motion. It means that it's much easier to keep something moving that's already in motion than to start starting something that's moving from, uh, from a stationary position. So they encourage everyone, no matter the age, you know, to keep moving. Well, truth is parallel. So what that means is, what is true in the natural is also true in the spiritual. Momentum is paramount. You must keep moving. You see, movement is evidence that there's still life. And where there's life, there's hope. And where there's hope, there's potential for miracle, signs, and wonders. The Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 47, verse 1 through 9. I have to admit that there is so much here in this passage that we can unpack today. I mean, we don't have all the time to unpack the whole thing today, but I believe that what we will share today will be a blessing to you. I'll reference it from the Living Bible, so those that are following along. It says, Then he brought me back to the door of the temple. I saw a stream flowing eastward and beneath the temple and, and passing to the right of the altar that is on its south also. Then he brought me outside the wall to the north passageway and around to the eastern entrance where I saw the stream flowing along on the south side of the eastern passageway. Measuring as he went, he took me a thousand cubits east along the stream and told me to go across. At that point, the water was up to my ankles. He measured off another thousand and told me to cross again. This time, the water was up to my knees. After a thousand, Another thousand after that, it was up to my waist. Another thousand, and it become a river so deep, I would not be able to get across unless I were to swim. It was too deep to cross on foot. He told me to keep in mind what I had seen, then led me back along the bank. Uh, not to my surprise, many trees were growing on both sides of the river. He told me this river flows east through the desert, and the Jordan Valley to the Dead Sea, where it will heal the salty waters and make them fresh and pure. 
Everything touching the water of this river shall live. Fish will abound in the sea, for its waters will be healed. Wherever this water flows, everything will live. Amen? Amen. That's what Amen. Right. So we're looking here in Ezekiel 47 at this powerful revelation about how the stream becomes a river. Not because there was no water or because the force of the water changed from God's side, but because of Ezekiel's proximity. The same thing is true for you and I. It's through or by proximity that God's presence is experienced, increased, and manifested to us, in us, and through us. Amen? Amen. Amen. I want you to pay special attention to where this river came from. It came out of a temple. The temple represents the place where God is, and it symbolizes His presence. And notice that everything starts at the door. The Bible references that Jesus is the door into the Father's house and the Father's presence. No man can come to the Father except through Jesus Christ. If you don't come through the door, Jesus said, you're a thief and a robber. Then notice that this river issued or flowed out from under the right side of the altar. The altar, referring here, is the place of surrender and sacrifice. The altar is the place where self is crucified. The altar is the place where our will, our plans, and our desires must die. It takes you to a whole other level. So that the Christ life can manifest through us. We have our own agenda, we have our own plans, but as you get close to the altar, your will and your ambition, you lay it down so Christ can be manifested to you. Just as Moses had to remove his shoes from his feet in order to fulfill his assignment, the altar is where we remove our shoes and of, of personal ambition or self-will so we can embrace our divine destiny in Christ Jesus. You see, we have our own ambitions. We, we have things that we want to accomplish and make sure, and we make sure that the, the religion or Christianity is an add-on to help us accomplish those goals. But it should be the other way around. We have to put Christ first, to seek His kingdom first, and His righteousness first, and all these things shall be added into you. Mm -hmm. To put it bluntly, the altar is the place where the old man dies, so the new man in Christ can live. <laughs> and just like the water came from under the altar, we must live under the weight of the altar on our flesh every day, because the flesh is strong and it will lead you in all kinds of bad directions. Jesus said, the Bible references in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, he said unto them all, if any man come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Which means your agenda takes second, third, fourth, fifth, or, or umpteenth place. You see, the Bible says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, it says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the flesh. He, he talks about living in the flesh because that's who we are physically in the flesh. But he says, the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, the river of God's presence and the power starts at the altar and the depth of the work of the cross at the altar determines the depth and the width and the force and, and, and the power of the river to us. First it is to us, then it is in us, and then it is through us. So to us, in us, and through us. That's how it works. Now, you see, when we do things where we lay ourselves down, a lot of times we, we have an issue, we have a problem, and we have some difficulty that's happening. And we want to overcome it. And we have all different ways of how to overcome those things. But God says, first get close to me. You know, be in, in the same, you know, where you have to lay yourself down. There was a time when Samaria, the Israelites were surrounded and besieged by the enemy. The prophet Elisha comes to them. And it was a very difficult time. Things were so expensive. They were buying doves, dung, and a donkey's head. And they were paying like some severe price for it. 
And they were starving because the enemy had surrounded them and they're starving them out so they open the gates and they'll come out and surrender. This is the situation. And Elijah comes in and he says, you know, trust in the Lord your God. Lean not on your own understanding. But Elijah declares to the king, you have to lean on God. And, he's, and he tells them, you think things are so bad today, God is going to change it tomorrow. When he says God is going to change it tomorrow, people are, you know, even the officer listening to him says, you don't know what you're talking about, Elijah. Do you see how difficult things are? They're out to get us. They're out to kill us. They're going to make things horrible for us. We're already suffering. And Elijah says, you know how expensive things are. Tomorrow, a loaf of bread, they were paying so high, he says, tomorrow it'll be sold for a penny. Incredible things that Elisha says. Because he says what's important is not the, the circumstances and situations that you understand. What's important is that you lean on the Lord God Almighty. He says, and the officer says, it's not going to happen because you don't understand the reality of the situation. You're just talking, you know, nonsense. Elisha turns to him and says, it'll happen, but you will not enjoy it. You will not have any part of it. And sure enough, the next day, four lepers that were seated at the entrance go out there. This is their logic. They say, if we're going to stay here, we'll starve and die. If we're going to go there, they might kill us and we'll die. We'll die either way. We'll go out and check it out. And they go check it out. And the enemy, the Lord had threatened them by a, just a sound effect. He creates the sound of the enemy, of the armies coming, and the enemy ran away, leaving behind vast amounts of food and jewelry and all kinds of things. And the enemy ran away. The lepers come back to the town and they say, this is our situation. We have plenty. Please come and take it. And they stampede to get to all the goodies. And they, uh, when they stampede, the officer who said, it's not going to happen, gets crushed in time. What am I saying? God can change things around like that. What's important to God is that you get closer to Him. The self must die. The, our understanding, our, or, or the way we think about things, you know, we say it's not going to work out because I see how this is headed. I see. Then the evidence. The officer was not, you know, he, he was, he's been an officer in, in there for a long time. He sees the evidence. What's the evidence? The enemy is outside their gates. The, the things are selling for really high price. They can't afford it. People are dying of starvation. He sees all that in the natural. And Elisha is calling them to a higher ground. He said, you got to come up here because these things can solve like that. God can take care of that. Put your eyes, focus on who God is and his abilities and his promises. And sure enough, the officer who did not believe does not get to enjoy. Even David, yeah. David, you know, when he's, when he's going around in the place where he's living among the Philistines, he comes back and it's a place called Ziklag, and he comes back, and his house, his wife, his, his, his kids, and, and his men, his 600 men who are with him, all of those people have been taken away. David looks at the situation, it's a hopeless situation. Anybody should be giving up on that hopeless situation. Anybody would look at that situation and say, I don't believe in God anymore. This is it, man. No, I've tried really hard. I've put myself out there and I tried to look for God. And look at it. Everything that I had is gone. You know, my house was burned and, and, and all of our possessions, all of our family, everything is taken off. And he couldn't worry like that. What I'm about to tell you, in the chronological event uh, of things that um, unfolded, you would see that David not only was able to encourage himself by seeking the Lord and going after his enemy, but also 72 hours from then, in the war, Saul dies and Israel calls David to be their king. What happened is 72 hours earlier, it looked like a hopeless situation. 72 hours earlier, it felt like he had lost everything. 72 hours earlier, his men were ready to stone him to death. 72 hours earlier, he felt like this world is just a waste of time following God, that sort of thing. He's just ready to give up. But I want to tell you something. When you lean on God, you know, when you're on the edge of your miracle, 
You know, a lot of people give up. God is saying, look, right. I'm here for you, and none of these situations that you see in the natural are too much for me, because I can change them all, and I can bring favor into your yeah. life. But God, you know, that's what happened. 72 hours later, you know, the same men who were with him, ready to stone him, you know, now revere him as king of Israel. The same men who, who thought it's not going to happen. All of these difficulties you can see, David eventually become king, in, uh, they anointed him king, and they made him king. He was already anointed by Samuel a long time ago, but all these struggles had to happen and build uh, character in him. And that character was necessary to where God was taking. A lot of times God is taking us through some amazing things like Ezekiel in the river. He said the river is about ankle deep. Well, it's still under his control. It's not, you know, to, you can always run back to the shore. Then it was me. Then it was hit. Then he had said no more control. He had to go with the flow. The deeper Ezekiel went into the river, the bigger the river got. In other words, the more Ezekiel died, the more the river of God's life could flow through. You see, where are the miracles and the signs and the wonders and all kinds of good things happening? It's, our, it's in proximity to God. As you draw closer to Him, you see all these things happen. The deeper His flesh, Ezekiel's flesh went down, the stronger the flow of the river. This is what the Holy Spirit is telling us. There is more to your Christian life than what meets the eye. The Christian life is progressive. Progressive death and progressive life. It doesn't matter how mature you are. You say, I'm a mature Christian. Or how anointed you are, you feel like I'm the anointed king. Well, it doesn't really matter. You haven't seen anything yet because God is always taking you to another level. There's no place, this is no place to get comfortable or complacent. The truth is, this Christian life is not automatic and you cannot do this on autopilot. You know, we love autopilot. You know, when, when, I, uh, I, when I drive home, uh, drive from home here or back home, you know, I, I don't even think about where the stop signs are because I know it. I've done it so many times, you know, I, I, unless, uh, you know, a meteor hits the road, <laughs> there, there's no way I'm missing my turns because I've done it so religiously. What am I saying? I'm saying we like to have things on autopilot. We go to church, we pray, we have difficulties, God answers, and we move on, we got another thing. But God is calling you closer. He says, you need to come closer. You need to move away from that ankle deep and the knee deep and the, and the hip deep where you still have control. He says, let me lead your life where you don't have any control. You see, you got to choose to, to get up and get moving. That's a choice you personally have to make. You have to choose to let go of the comfortable and the convenient and the familiar. You have to choose to boldly and aggressively press and stretch yourself out to go deeper. You have to choose to dive into the Word of God and search out the hidden riches there. You have to choose to sanctify yourself from the world and live a holy life. God is calling, you know, he's not saying, I'm only calling these people, he's calling everyone here to a higher call. You have to choose, the, you know, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You have to choose to lay aside every weight that, uh, and the sin that so easily besets us. Now going to church does not make you holy any more than parking a pinto under a Cadillac sign makes it a Cadillac. It's like, oh, that's a Cadillac sign. That's not a Cadillac because, you know, you know what it is. Somebody said, I'm going through such a hard time in life, a hard place, really. You know, and I'm struggling. I say, praise God, that's great. You know, when you're struggling, and I say, praise God, you may wonder, what was that all about? You know why you're saying, praise God? That means that you haven't been conquered. That means you're not dead yet. That means you're still, you still have the possibility uh, of you possessing everything God has promised you. That there's a way to do this. That means you're still, you know, disturbing hell or the, or the devil wouldn't be fighting you so hard. The devil, think of it this way. It took Jesus up to you know a high point, up to the mountain, and it's showing Jesus. Look at all of the things, all of the kingdoms of the earth. Take a look. All you need to do is bow down and worship me, and I'll give you all of this. Seriously, if it can do that to Jesus, how much more of a temptation can it give us? Without Jesus, we don't stand a chance. But with Jesus, 
Please stand every bit of chance. That's what I'm saying. Get closer to him. Get your eyes off of the world and get your eyes on Jesus. Amen. And he draws you closer. He says, come to the altar where it's more than the hip deep, where you can't have any control, where the Holy Spirit leads you all the way through. You see, you have to keep moving, meaning making progress, getting close to God in your own personal walk. You gotta get to tell yourself, or even somebody, you know, I'm gonna go where I've never gone before to make that kind of change. I'm gonna see what I've never seen before. I'm gonna hear what I've never heard before. I'm gonna feel what I've never felt before. I'm gonna do what I've never done before. I'm gonna step into a new level of God's anointing in my life. I'm changing addresses, you should say. Sickness and disease can't go where I'm going. Poverty and lack can't go where I'm going. Fear and anxiety and stress can't go where I'm going. You see, all these things will pull you back. You cannot live the godly life. You cannot live the full Christian life with all these things are weighing you down. Folks, oh, somebody even is watching you. Somebody's waiting to you, you to get across the river. So people are watching. You know, you said you're a Christian. You said you're all this, but you're struggling through. They want you to. Well, they want you if you can make it through. And if you make it through, they go. That's a good testimony. I think I'll try that myself. To crawl out of the pit, they're waiting for you to see. Huh? Is he crawling out of the pit? You know. You got to tell yourself, I'm going to make it. Because I'm going to keep moving. Ezekiel reached a place where it was too deep to walk anymore, to go any further. He had to swim. Because this is the place where what we call transition. From where you're walking and you have control to absolutely no control. What happened when you reached this place? This is the place of decision. This is where you either enter a new dimension or you settle into a lesser level. Where I was born is a, is a peninsula. And it meets three oceans, you know, and, um, and, and they have some of the longest beaches. And so I was on the beach and I'm going through the water and, and you know, uh, uh, thought, yeah, let me try to get into the water some more. And I keep going a little bit, a little bit more, and the ocean's feeling like it's a little deeper. And one more step, I never expected this to happen, one more step, it didn't go like this, it went like this and then it went down. <laughs> it's like... One more step, and I, I don't know how much deeper it was, but I knew I had no more footing. I either had to swim, or I had to get back to the shore. Back then, I got back to the shore. Mm -hmm. You see, when you reach this place of transition, where you have some control to having no control, this is where you either enter a new dimension, or you settle to a lesser level. You say, I'm not gonna be that spiritual. I'm not, I don't want that much religion in my life. I'm happy where I am kind of thing. Up until this point, you're on your feet. There's a pressure of the flow against you, but as long as you're on your feet, there's re the, the resistance to the river's agenda. The river's got its own agenda, but as long as you're standing, yeah, I still can, you know, the river represents the flow of the Holy Spirit. Going with the current of the river means that you're surrendered and yielded to the will of the power of the Holy Spirit. Many people will never make the transition they go. You know, I don't want to go that deep. Why? Because this is the place where your feet are no longer deciding the direction of your life. You know, for the little understanding that we have, and God makes it clear, do not lean on your own understanding in all your ways of knowledge. And that's what the Bible says in Proverbs 3.16. We have to lean on his own. We have very little comprehension of the issues and matters of life and the solutions to it. God in his omniscience has all of the way. You know, he understands it completely and his ways are better, his ways are higher. You have to lean on him. He says, lean on me. I'll show you where to go. I'll, I'll, I'll lead you in paths of righteousness. He will lead us. But we got to trust Him. The way to trust Him is not to still have all the control or some element of control, but to let Him completely. Oh, it's a hard thing. Yes, it's a hard thing. It's a scary thing. You know, at this place, your flesh is under subjection to the Holy Spirit. This is where the Holy Spirit decides when and where and how far and how fast you go. Because you don't know, it's just going to take you along for the, for the journey. The Holy Spirit desires inside your stops and your starts. It won't make any sense, you know, in the beginning. Like Elijah, a man of God, just like you and me, he says, oh, there will not be any rain for three and a half years. Sure, there was no rain for three and a half years. And he's that powerful, he, told, he goes and tells King Ahab that. 
But then God has him saying, go live by the current. The brook, you'll drink some water. I'm going to eat. Well, I'll have the ravens come and feed you. Meet in the morning, meet in the afternoon. I'll, I'll have so the birds come and give you something. What sense does that make in the natural? Here he is a man who portrayed himself as, as God's prophet. And he's declared some amazing things and it's all happened. Now God takes him from that to going living by the third brook. Just drink some water out of there. And for food, the birds will bring you something. Doesn't make much sense. In, uh, there's no control whatsoever for Elijah. But Elijah obeys and he goes. What am I saying? I'm saying Elijah is a man just like us, the Bible says. Meaning he's just like you and me. He's nothing special. But he was able to listen and God lifted him up to heights. He took him to a, he said, go to Zarephath. He went to Zarephath. He says, there's a widow there. Ask her if, you know, he, his, his instructions are to go and be with that widow in the sense that she will feed him during a famine. The widow is collecting some sticks. So she's got a little oil and there's some flour in her home that she can make a little bread and she and her son can eat that. And then she says, and then we're going to die because we got nothing more. We're going to die of starvation. That's her situation. And here comes Elijah and he says, what are you doing? God has sent him there. He does not understand. He doesn't know this woman from anywhere. He doesn't uh, you know, know her situation or nothing. So he goes to her woman, the widow in Zarephath. That's all he knows. So he goes to Zarephath right at the entrance. Here is this woman gathering some firewood. So he asks her, what are you doing? He says, I'm gathering some firewood. Okay, well, to do what? So make some, I have a little flour and oil. I'm going to make some bread for me and my son. It's our last meal. We have nothing more left. And then we will die. Elijah says, oh, I understand. He understood God, what God is doing. He said, God's going to bless her through him. And he says, why don't you do exactly what you're saying, but make me some first. Who in their right mind will do that? The widow in her right mind will not do that, you know, because it says she's got a little bit, she's going to eat it, and then she's going to die. This is all she's got left. And she's a widow. There's no man in the house to provide for anything. Then that's the situation. God makes it extremely difficult for that widow to even listen to, to any kind of reasoning that Elijah might have. But she listens and follows through. In our own life, a lot of times what God is asking you to do may not make any sense. Mm -hmm. And you could very well ignore what he's saying. Or as Pharaoh did in the Bible says, harden your heart. Because the heart says, I don't think that's what God does. I don't think this is what God wants me to do. Because it doesn't make any sense. What sense did it make for the, for the widow to make Elijah some food and, 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 you know, when she was going to die? She doesn't know this man from, you know, from Adam. She, she just looks at him. And of course, Elijah is not great to look at. He's been living off the brook and eating uh, food that was brought by birds. Who knows what they brought? And so he's, here's this raggy man going there and saying, make me first something. But she senses something. God is telling her something. And she does. In her obedience is the relief, is her deliverance. She says, okay. And she does. Elijah tells her, the oil and the flour will not run. It will be there. It won't run dry for the rest of the family. It will be fine. And she was fine. What am I saying? I'm saying in our own personal life, we want as much control as we can get over the issues and matters of life. But what I'm going to add to that equation is, it's based on what we understand the situation to be. I had children, you know, before I had children, I, I thought, uh, you know, I knew what was best. I thought, you know, when I was in high school, I thought, I already know everything I need to know in life. And as I progressed, I thought, yeah, now I know everything in life. But then as I said, keep going, and I live and live, and then I figured I don't know anything. <laughs> so, so when my kids grow up, and I see them, and, and they're passing high school, and they, they go through the same cycle. They say, I know everything. They know everything. <laughs> but I know they don't know everything. And they go through college. They yeah, graduate yeah, now. And now they think they know everything. <laughs> well, I know that they don't know everything. Because I've been there. 
And they not just know everything, they tell me they know everything. We know that. We know what's going on. We know, we know. This is this is the starting of all the sentences they say. We know. 